Welcome to the video talking about falling body problems. When an object is thrown straight up or straight down, we call this the behavior of a falling body. So let's just, uh, in general, look at how falling body problems are set up. The difference between particle motion, object motion, and falling body problems is generally we're frankly talking about acceleration being gravity. A falling body is going to behave in a certain way on the surface of the earth and we're guaranteed that it's always going to behave this way. So if an object's thrown straight up or straight down from an initial height of, we'll call that s naught. that's how that's pronounced, s naught feet, with an initial velocity of v naught feet per second, and if s is its height above the ground in feet after t seconds, then all falling body problems are going to be modeled by this quadratic equation. It is true that all falling body problems are going to have this squared term, negative 16 t squared, plus whatever that initial velocity was, this v naught and the v naught in the position function are the same, it's v naught times t, plus the constant here is going to be our initial position, our initial height above where we start. If we start at the surface of the earth, for instance, on the surface of the earth, we mathematicians generally agree that that is zero feet. All right. Okay. So there is the general form for any falling body problem. So let's work an example here and, and kind of walk through all the different pieces. Falling body problems, again, they're generally going to ask you the same types of things. And so we're just going to use our knowledge of what goes on on the surface of the earth with height, velocity, and acceleration and all that and answer these questions. So from the top of a building 160 feet high, a ball was thrown upward with an initial velocity of 64 feet per second. So we can actually come up with the position function here. All right, so negative 16t squared plus the initial velocity, an initial velocity of 64 feet per second, so plus 64 t plus initial position from the top of a building 160 feet high. So for this particular problem, here is the function that models the function that models the position of the ball at any time t. So if you want to know where that ball is after three seconds, well, I'm just going to plug in t equal three, and s of three would tell me where the ball was after three seconds. So now we have a function that models what's going on. So let's say they ask us when did it reach the maximum height, all right? So in terms of a falling body and velocity, we'll have to imagine the behavior of the falling body. And we want to model the behavior of this falling body. We recognize that they are all parabolas that open down. So we can model a falling body by a graph, let's see here, of a parabola that opens down. So when we throw it up, initially it's going to travel upward and then it'll hit its maximum point, the, the maximum point at which it can fight gravity, and then all of a sudden it's going to turn and start traveling back down to the surface of the earth. So for us here, our s of t, we said s naught was 160 feet, so I know this is 160 feet. I know that's my s of t position, right? This is the output. Here's the t axis, and I know that this is where s of t equals zero. And here, at whatever this t value is, it's not exactly straight, but we'll pretend it is. At whatever that t value is, that is the max height. So the maximum height is going to be at the apex of that parabola that opens down. 
So how do we find that? Well, algebraically, it's a, you know, I think we always went here where we tried to find this zero and this zero, and then we realized that the distance halfway between those two zeros was going to give us uh, our t coordinate, our horizontal or independent variable coordinate. Well, algebraically, it's a little bit difficult to find. So using calculus, what's an easier way to find the maximum point on this ball's position over time? Well, think of velocity. How can velocity help us here? What's happening on our velocity function right there at that t value? Well, we can see that's where the velocity function equals zero. So using calculus, it's much easier to find what's going on on this function. So here's the function. It's going to reach its maximum point when its velocity equals zero. So all we've got to do is find the velocity function, which is the derivative of the position function with respect to t, and set it equal to zero, because that's what's happening at that max. And so our t value is two. So the ball will be at its maximum height at t equal two. And so this next question is, what is its maximum height? Well, if it wants to know a position anywhere, that's back to the position function. So if I know it reaches its max height at two seconds, then all I have to do is plug two into the position function. And so its maximum height was 224 feet. Again, notice something here. If I am ask a question in words, I answer the question in words. Here's the mathematics that I'm going to prove to the AP reader that I know what I'm talking about, but here's my answer. This is what the AP reader is looking for. If they ask me in words, I'm going to answer in words. So when will it hit the ground? Well, any object is going to hit the ground when its position is zero. And it's asking a when question, so it wants to know at what time will it hit the ground. So all I need to do is go back and pick up my position function, set it equal to zero, and find the t value. Now here's some algebra involved in this problem. It is a quadratic equation. I have used the quadratic formula. I'm going to come out with two answers. Well, that would make sense because remember when we modeled this, it was modeled by a parabola. Well, a parabola has two zeros. One that opens down where its vertex is above the x-axis, or t-axis, is going to have two zeros. One of them over here is t equals some negative value, and over here is t equals some positive value. Well, in the context of throwing a ball, this value, even though uh, algebraically I'm going to find that value, has no meaning. So I just get to throw it out because it doesn't have any meaning in the context of my problem. So it's going to hit the ground at 5.74 seconds. With what speed will it hit the ground? Remember, speed is the absolute value of velocity. We found the velocity function to be negative 32t plus 64. And we said that it hits the ground at t equal 5.74 seconds. So I'm looking for v of 5 point, oops, 74 seconds. So that's plugging in 5.74 in 4t. If that's a negative value, then I'm just going to take the absolute value of it. And, and it is. It's negative 119.73. So again, speed's the absolute value of velocity. Ask in words. Answered in words. What was its acceleration at t equal to? That's the second derivative of position, or the first derivative of velocity. And that was negative 32 feet per second per second, or 
32 feet, negative 32 feet per second squared. So much of the mathematical work we've done on this type of falling body problem can be translated into other falling body problems. All we need is our initial height, and then we need our initial velocity, and we can work with any falling body problem. You are going to encounter on the AP test most especially a lot of real world-ish word problems. And it's going to be so important that you can take those words and turn them into a mathematical equation where you can model what's going on with mathematics and then determine the rate at which what you know is going on is changing or the acceleration of what's going on or when the most or the least or the greatest or the smallest is happening. So we can take physical phenomena and represent its actions using mathematical symbols and explore its behavior from a mathematical standpoint. Your ability to produce a mathematical model will become more and more important the further we go through this school year. Are you able to take a word description and model it with mathematics? Water is leaking from a cylindrical tank at a rate proportional to the depth of the water. If you can't turn that into mathematics, we're in trouble and it takes time, it takes practice to be able to do this and you'll become increasingly better and better and better at it. All right, so we have a cylindrical tank. I'm, I'm visual, I'm gonna draw myself a picture. There's my cylindrical tank and water is leaking from this tank. Well, that tells me something about the volume, the volume of the water in that tank is decreasing. And I know that the volume is the area of the base, which is a circle, times the height, right? And I know if I wanna talk about volume changing, then I'm talking about the change in volume over time. And I know that that is decreasing there's a negative. Let's say I call the depth of water the height. We're going to call the, the height of that cylindrical tank, we'll call it H. Well, water is leaking from a cylindrical tank at a rate proportional to, so I just need some constant value there, to the depth of the water. So now, if you ask me, you're going to have to give me some particulars about, you know, how much water is in there and the actual volume of the water or all those kinds of things. But you can ask me about what rate is it decreasing. You can ask me about what is the proportionality constant. You can ask me about what the height is when the rate of the volume is changing at a certain point. So if I can come up with a mathematical model of what's going on in my words, then I can answer all kinds of questions about that problem. So let's look really quickly here if we had a good model, and we did. A wheel is spinning at a constant rate of six revolutions per minute. Well, when I talk revolution, I think angle measure. Angle measure to me is theta. One revolution for me is two pi, because I do everything in radians. So if you ask me about the rate at which it's spinning, that's d theta dt, and I have six revolutions per minute, so there's 12 pi revolutions per minute. We'll stop here and pick up with the rest of the lesson in the next video.